when I see it, I'm like, I have compassion, but like, let's work on that. Hey dancers, it's Kirsten. Welcome back to the Confident Dancer YouTube channel. Today we're here for my part two of my pet peeves. Last time I did a video on my pet peeves as a ballet teacher about things that dancers do in my classroom. This week I'm flipping the script, okay? It is about, as a ballet dancer now, pet peeves I have about things that ballet teachers do. Disclaimer, this is all in good fun, all in jest. Yes, these things are real things that I, I get like annoyed about, but it's just meant for laughs, all right? Not trying to be judgy or throw a lot of shade on the internet. Just a little shade, just to laugh, okay? So now that we're clear, okay, okay, great. If you're new, welcome. If you don't know me, I used to be a full-time professional ballet dancer. Now I dance for the joy of it. I teach ballet on the side, also for the joy of it. And I work primarily as a mindset coach for ballet dancers, specializing in helping dancers build confidence and overcome mental blocks like self-doubt, performance anxiety, low self-esteem, and things like that that really inhibit dancers from having mental well-being and performing their best. So if that resonates with you and you're looking for that kind of support, you can always visit the link down below to theconfidentdancer.com or kirstenkemp.com. They both lead to the same place where you can learn more about my work, how we can work together, and you can apply for a free 30-minute consultation to connect and be able to see if working together will be a great fit. So with that being said, let's get on with the video. Pet peeve number one is when teachers do not show the combinations with any sense of musicality at all. Like, we're talking no counts. We're talking not at the tempo that they want it. We're talking not even with a sense of rhythm. We're talking getting really inconsistent. Like we go fast and then we go slow and there, there's no counts. There's no sense of rhythm at all to, for me to latch onto. And so for me, that is a huge problem because I am an auditory learner. I learn primarily by hearing. I process the rhythm that they're speaking. I process the counts or even just speaking the combination in a musical rhythmic kind of way, like ton do out and a close, ton do side and a close. Like I already know what the rhythm is, what the tempo is, like I'm processing it and I'm even feeling it kinesthetically. And I know I'm not the only dancer that learns like that. So for me, I just feel so lost whenever the music actually comes on. It's like a surprise what it's gonna be. And if there's live music, I can tell that the accompanist is also very confused, God bless them, and so they don't even know what the best song is or tempo or key signature is to actually bring into pairing with this combination, and so typically the music itself that they're picking doesn't even really match because we're all confused. And so that is just super frustrating to me personally. I do my best with it, like I always love the frame of like A, taking responsibility for my own experience, so I ask myself, okay, there's that. What am I going to do about it? I'm not going to let this ruin my time. And then the other thing is asking myself, how could this be an opportunity? And so I tend to use it as an opportunity to actually start adding in my own musicality and my own head while they're showing the combination. And I treat it like a learning challenge for me because it makes it harder to learn the combinations and harder to dance with artistry because I haven't had a moment to like imagine, okay, how is the music sound? Like what kind of quality do I want to bring into it? Because I don't even know if the fondue is like a freaking tango or like something like a ronde jambe. Like, I don't know. So I use it as an opportunity to think on my feet, but I hate it. <laughs> and then that also leads into pet peeve number two. I've noticed out of the it feels like hundreds, probably more like dozens and dozens of ballet teachers I've experienced in my life. It seems like there's this broad, widely held assumption that dancers are visual learners. And that kind of drives me crazy because that's actually not true. Now, I know we're getting into the nitty gritty of like learning theory and stuff, but I think it is pretty common knowledge that there are visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners, like people who process through doing and like feeling it in their body, through sounds, like hearing it 
in their head or by sight, like watching. And so I heard so many, even like professors in college who seem to continue to have the assumption, like everyone's a visual learner. And I was actually talking to one of my professors about that because she was teaching a pedagogy class that I was in, like a class about basically how to teach ballet well. And I brought that up, like I've encountered that most teachers assume we're visual learners. So as long as they kind of demonstrate we're good, but I'm an auditory learner and a lot of times Teachers show with no sense of musicality and it drives me crazy. <laughs> and she was like, wow, like I didn't even understand that as a teacher. I thought a lot more people were visual and I didn't think it was such a problem. And it even transcends into how, I think this is good for teachers to hear too. If you're always giving your students, especially young students, visual analogies to understand technical concepts, you're going to be leaving a few of those kids behind because not everyone processes information in a visual way primarily in their head. Like we all do it to some extent, but it's not everyone's primary learning modality. So sometimes like using tonality to, uh, like I had a teacher who was so good about this. Like you can tell what quality he wanted in the movement by the tonality in his voice. He would say in arabesque and close. Like you could tell you, he wanted you to like elongate and then close sharply into your pot beret. Okay, you would go pot beret. You know, and you could tell quick, quick suspend, like just from the way he used his voice. And I was thriving in that class. I mean, other than the fact that he definitely had some attitude issues, but when he didn't have those, I was thriving. <laughs> okay, number three, especially as an adult ballet dancer now, like, yeah, I still perform freelance professionally here and there, but a lot of times the way I dance is I just show up to these open classes. And so I'm just taking as, let's say an adult student, let's say, or dancer, I'm always a student, right? We're always teachers and students. For me, at, especially at this stage of my life, but I think this definitely applies to younger dancers too. It's a pet peeve when teachers really harp on like super obvious mistakes that the dancer, in my opinion, clearly knows that they made. Like for example, there have been times where I know I'm like having trouble controlling my long body that day and I know I keep leaning back in my passe balance, my criteria balance and I'm like clearly putting in the effort to like bring my body forward because I keep falling back and then the teacher will be like don't fall back you're leaning back and I'm like no freaking duh like obviously <laughs> we're getting kind of far out here but it's like I know, I know, and it's it's fine. It's it's okay if you know that comes out every now and then. Like that's totally normal to just comment on it. Totally fine. But sometimes when it's really excessive and they keep doing it, it's like, do you think I don't feel that I am falling back? I can see it. I can feel it. I'm literally living it in my own body. So it's like, I know. And I had this one teacher when I was around 16, I did YGP and she was my coach. And we were reviewing my feedback sheet together. And it just said, like, don't fall off point. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> clearly I stumbled out of a pirouette. And she just made the funniest joke. She was like, oh, right. Like, I forgot, that's that's not what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> thank you, I forgot, that's that's the point. Oh, thank you. And sometimes it's just, it, it's okay if it happens every now and then, but when it's repetitive and they always seem to focus on stuff like that, it's like, thank you, I have a brain, thank you so much. Like, don't worry, I already beat myself up about it. Like, you don't have to <laughs> add on to it. And I, I know that I can definitely grow in this area too. As a teacher, I'm always trying to be more conscientious of cues that the students are already processing it themselves. I don't wanna layer on more reminders like, oh yeah, you did that wrong, but it happens and it's annoying. <laughs> okay, this next one, I'm literally calling myself out right now because I know for a fact I get excited and I talk and I start going into theory and I start going Going into detail but one thing I've been working on for years and I'm still working on it is learning how to give insightful information and break things down and help the students improve and like workshop things while still keeping a good pace in the class like 
it's really hard. And so sometimes my pet peeve as a dancer is when the teacher is always stopping or they take a long time to show accommodation or they will just keep talking about something and it's like, okay, we got it. I'm literally calling myself out right now because I know I do it and I actually annoy myself when I know I'm doing it. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna stop now. We're just gonna move on. I learned over time, especially being in a company, like the classes are in my experience, they were much faster paced than what most academies do because we were just like not really pausing for a lot of corrections. We were just going. And I improved a lot during that time. And it's just a reminder that ultimately we are going to improve by doing. And yes, it's helpful to have some moments of pause to rethink our strategy and approach so that we can improve more efficiently and dance more efficiently. But at the same time, you're ultimately going to get better by actually doing the thing. Okay, this one, I'm, I'm really going there. This pet peeve is when teachers have not taken the time to do their own inner work and they're really bringing their insecurities and their ego into the classroom. Like, we all know that ego is not cute. When a teacher really has a big ego, they're gonna do like weird power play kind of games. They're gonna, you know, act like they're up here and we're all their subjects. Like, we, we know that, we hate that. It's gross. But a lot of times, really well-intentioned teachers actually probably don't know they're coming off this way, but their insecurities are really, really, really obvious. Like, they'll continue to make self-deprecating comments that's something I'm still working on. Like I have pretty good confidence and self-esteem, but every now and then just, I get back in the ballet culture. I'm in the ballet studio. A lot of people self-deprecate, it'll slip. And then I'll try to kind of like take back and say something more emp empowering, but it's so normal. And when a teacher like clearly has a lot of insecurities, what it projects is like, it actually makes the focus all on them and it's like they're actually making everything about them like oh I didn't demonstrate that well or like oh I'm really old and I can't do this or I'm so bad at this or whatever or I totally messed that up oh sorry 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 it's like okay we get it just like let's just focus on the task at hand like a lot of dancers can be very understanding like we understand no one's perfect but if you're always fixating on what you do wrong and saying self-deprecating things and clearly projecting a lot of insecurity it makes everyone feel kind of bad for you and like uncomfortable where we all just want to be able to focus on ourselves and so that's why i think doing your own inner work especially as a teacher is so important because you're going to project your own fears limiting beliefs and insecurities you're not only going to take up that space in the classroom with those things but you're also going to project that onto young impressionable students especially so that's something to really be cautious about that is a big pet peeve of mine okay this next one i'm sure a lot of y'all agree with me i really don't mind when a teacher points out a certain student and says hey can you demonstrate it i really loved how you did this specifically i would love for everyone to see it that's okay i mean if it's always the same person all the time it's like annoying because I really enjoy a more egalitarian classroom where we all feel like we're equally valued. It doesn't mean like everyone has to get a gold star and everyone has to hear a good job, but like everyone's given the time of day, you know, that's important. And so anyway, I don't mind when someone is kind of pointed out, but when they specifically say everyone do it like them, to me, I don't know about y'all, but that kind of rubs me the wrong way when they keep saying that because it's just reinforcing she is a good dancer. Be like her instead of like, she did this thing well. I like that choice you made. Let's all learn from that. <laughs> but you're not like imposing on the other people that idea like be like her. It's a subtle but powerful linguistic shift, but I do think it really matters. And so when I see that continually happening, I'm like... I don't like that. Now, I'm gonna point out some super obvious pet peeves that no one likes, right? One being when a teacher continually uses fear and punishment to motivate students, that is an absolute no, big red flag, no. For example, something I experienced in my training in the realm of fear mongering is I had this teacher who would say things like, in a ballet company, if you leave to use the restroom in the middle of class, you might get fired. That's literally not even true, like why would you say that? Or like, I got in trouble for drinking 
water one time. Like she said I was drinking too much water in the middle of class. I was literally just trying to work on my hydration. You know, I hear one thing from the doctor, like you need to be more hydrated. You get crazy cramps because you don't drink enough water. I go in the ballet class, she's flipping yelling at me, literally goes on a huge rant because I'm drinking too much water. And she was like, how are you ever going to do Swan League? You don't have time to drink water for 45 minutes. Okay, A, that's literally not true. You go off stage. And also I had already done the core of Swan Lake before she had said that to me. So it was like, thanks, okay. Or like fear mongering, like if you don't fix this or if you don't have a 180 degree turnout, like you will never be a dancer. It's like, okay, why don't you just help us to improve our rotation? Sometimes there are scary facts, okay? Facts that do induce fear, humility, it just gets real sometimes. That's fine. I'm not about sugarcoating the truth. But if you're using that kind of language to constantly make students scared or punishing them, like if you don't do this, I literally had that same teacher say, I will literally hurt you if you mess up your double step over turn to the left because we already fixed it. Like she literally said that to me. I have, oh my gosh, I have so many stories about this lady. Like she she did a number on me, y'all. Um, like as you could probably surmise from these examples. Using stuff like that to create fear to then motivate the students, like big no-no for me. And I'm sure a lot of you agree on that one. Fear and punishment, thumbs down. Another obvious one I won't spend a lot of time on, playing favorites. It's just not cute. It's just not fun. It makes the other students feel like they can never win, so why try? It just feels incredibly demotivating because it's like, I'm here to learn and I feel like I have an uphill battle with that. Like you're not pouring into me at all and I'm, I'm literally paying tuition to be helped and I'm invisible because what, like I'm not worth investing in at all. Double thumbs down for that one. Okay, the last one I'll say is constantly saying no, bad, wrong without actually providing help or just pointing out like you fell back in your turn. It's like, yeah, okay, <laughs> but like, are you actually providing solution? That's, it's not fair if the teacher continually just points out what's wrong without actually giving the student, what can you do? What do you need to learn? How can I help? That's just irritating. It's like, obviously they, they know that they fell back out of the turn. Okay, y'all, it's been a fun time. It's been a sassy time. I hope it was entertaining and hopefully not too infuriating to go through these pet peeves. And I'd love to hear if there are any I didn't mention that you happen to have. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, definitely give the video a thumbs up. I would really appreciate that. And I'll see you next week. Bye!